So I'm here with uh, Niall O'Carroll, sports psychologist. Is that the correct word, Niall? Um, qualified in sports psychology. I like to think of myself more as a, a mental skills coach. So now, tell us a little bit, I suppose, about your background and you know the fact that you're going to be kind of contributing to Sporting Limerick and the Limerick Post over the over the next few months with regards to kind of bringing people the the inside track or the the otherwise less explored parts of you know successful sports teams and what goes into it. Um, yeah, well, it's it's actually it's a, a, an exciting time really because I've only recently returned home to Limerick. I was obviously on a Limerick boy. I went to school in the Crescent, grew up in up in Bally Simon there on Children's Road. Um, I um, yeah, I've worked in the whole area of sports psychology in the Olympic systems in Canada and Britain, and uh, returned home to Ireland late last year. Um, and I'm kind of intrigued by the approach to psychology here in sport in comparison to somewhere like Canada, where you know I suppose Ireland has a tendency to be a little bit behind the curve in a lot of things. Um, and I think there's still an element of thinking about employing a psychologist is a sign of weakness in a team. And I think that, that, that Limerick in the, the hurling team last year showed that having a psychologist on site um, who is completely bought into what the coaching structure is doing and the coaching structure buy into what she's doing, you see the, the results that come from it and, and all the fallout afterwards of, you know, there's, it, all of the talk coming out of the Limerick camp since the All-Ireland is positive and it's, it's, it's a real challenge and it's something we'll be exploring in the articles. There are things like how do you back, in, back up an All-Ireland title and retain the title, um, which is what the Limerick Hurling team are facing this year. Um, and it's, it's, it's a challenge but, but all the soundings coming out of Limerick so far are really, really strong because they're very much refocused on something new as opposed to let's keep doing what we did before. Um, and, and the articles will be exploring those kind of things. I, I always talk about um, the uncommon sense of high performance and an awful lot of the issues that, that people uh, gloss over in pursuit of excellence in sport are the obvious things, the simple things. We're always looking, as human beings, we look for the most complicated answer to any problem. And actually, quite often, it's the simple attention to detail um, solutions that, that are the most successful. Um, one, one of the things I work in most of is uh, around the area of distraction control and understanding how distractions off the field impact on your ability to perform on the field. And if you can lessen those distractions, you automatically give a player a, a greater opportunity to perform. So why do you think uh, you know, Ireland has been behind that curve in, in adapting or in, in picking up the use of, of, uh, of mental coaching, especially with sports? Um, I, think, I think it's probably a cultural thing that we're, you know, I mean, there's all this campaign at the moment we're talking about our feelings. And we're not the greatest nation in the world when it comes to talking about our feelings. And we are getting better, for sure. But, you know, it's, it's that classic thing in Ireland where you know, you'll always meet, every time you meet someone, you're like, how are you getting on? And straight away, as soon as they start to tell you how they're actually getting on, you're like, okay, I don't really want to know. <laughs> you know, it's just being nice. And we, and, and, and to be fair, it's not necessarily just an Irish thing. I know I worked with one uh, Olympic champion rower in Britain, and I worked with him in his transition out of sport, where I helped him strategize a career out of sport. And his big problem during sport was that he felt he couldn't go to his coach and say, I'm really struggling this week, I'd like to talk to someone because his coach was seen as a weakness and there was so much competition for places in the boat that if he showed weakness, he's gone and somebody else is in. So changing that myth around needing a psychologist being a sign that there's some sort of illness involved is, is a massive step. And I think it needs stories of success for people to understand. And, and like with, um, I mean, pretty much all the, the, the top teams in GAA now employ psychologists where a couple of years ago, no one did. And when I, I, I work with the meat senior team at the moment, and when I came into the meat senior setup, the general feeling was, well, why do we need one of you? You know, no, nobody else is doing it. And you're kind of going, well, actually, you look at every semi-finalist in the All-Ireland last year and the year before, all of them had employed something. So it is part of the development of sport. And I suppose if you, when you go into an organisation or when you go into a team like that and you have to address that scepticism what's the first step that you take or what's the first case study that you use um 
the first presentation I did with them, and it's one I use a lot in uh, a lot of sports, is I showed them a 60 second clip of New Zealand and Ireland in Lansdowne Road in 2013, when Ireland had basically battered New Zealand off the park for, for 79 minutes turned over a penalty on the New Zealand 10 metre line as the clock is heading towards the red. And then New Zealand, who were chasing the perfect year, um, but had absolutely physically been beaten off the park by them, um, get on the ball on the penalty. And then they go through what I always talk about as being process over outcome, which is a very common thing you'll hear with psychologists. But it's, it's being in that moment of doing the simple things, following your job, doing the key points that have been in the game plan well and, and simply and recycling the ball, hitting the line of speed. They did, if you go back and look at that clip, it's, it's a fantastic example, probably the best example I can think of, of process over there, because they were desperate to win their perfect year, their 14 game in a row. But nobody tried to produce the champagne pass, nobody went to kick the ball in behind and panic. Nobody tried to do anything that was outrageous. They all did simple things really, really well. And they trusted the game plan and they trusted each other. And it was a great example. I, I, I showed it to the meat lads. And I thought it was a great example to show guys that when you build that level of trust in each other as a group, it doesn't matter what you call what it is we're working on. All we're looking to do is to have 15 guys on the field who believe in each other, trust in each other, and know their roles. And once you do all those things, you've got a far greater opportunity to be successful. And of course, the, a very good year for the meat footballers this year. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been good so far. Um, our big challenge now is to park the league. I mean, the league is fantastic. And one of our goals at the start of the year was to achieve promotion to Division 1 next year. And Mead haven't been in the top flight for the bones of 20 years. I mean, the, people talk about 13 years ago they were in Division 1B. But would be was to all intents and purposes Division Two, so this is the first time, almost back to the last time we won in All Ireland, that they're playing in the very top flight of football. So it's uh, it's a massive achievement for these these group of lads, and there's a whole generation of new supporters who haven't seen me play regularly at that level. So that's huge. Now we've got to take that, take the confidence from that, and park it and go. Okay, championship starts in two weeks' time. Reset. What's our what are the new goals we're setting? Where do we go from here? And I suppose depending on the client or depending on the team and where they are, you know, it's, it's, is there a different mindset going into a team who are defending a championship or who are, you know, or a team who are trying to end a, a 20 year famine or, you know, a team that's going through transition with younger players coming in where there's some older guys moving on? Do you assess each case individually or are the common threads and the common goals the same throughout? Um, well there are, there are obvious common principles around defending a title or being a team like Munster who have had you know a run of semi-final defeats in Europe and, and how do you pick yourself up to go again when it consistently happens um, and there are kind of theories around those things but I'm much more interested in individuals um, and what I try to do is, is I, I try to get an understanding of where where they're at collectively but where they are, in, are, are at individually and then we try to build plans according to individuals. I'm a big believer in, I developed this, I, it, it, I, I use the term psychometric questionnaire, it's not really a psychometric questionnaire but what it is, is it's a questionnaire that def, it creates a little bit of awareness in them of where they're at and it's to understand what do they look like at their best, what do they look like when they're not at their best, what, the, what are their distractions, what are the things that they could improve, you know, 1% by what things they could improve greatly on, and more or less give them a blueprint to say, right, this is where you're at, this is where you want to get to, and let's build a, uh, let's set some goals to get there. Um, and then you set kind of a goal for the team, and you set a goal for individuals. And depending on where they're at, the goals are kind of, goals, in my view, goals are much more successful when they're about individual improvement as opposed to outcomes and results and so like having having a goal of winning in all ireland or winning a european cup is wonderful um, i worked at a golfer once whose who's lifetime goal was to win the masters which is a fantastic thing to do and it's my favorite sporting event um, but the masters it, to, to get into the masters you have to be in the top 50 in the world to get an invite because you can't qualify for the masters so it's also the hardest major to qualify for 
So in order to get into the top 50 in the world, you have to be playing regularly in the top events and earning money. And at the time I was working with him, he needed to be playing in America. So we had to kind of go, well, how are we going to get on the American tour? And then it's, you know, what aspects of your game need to improve in order for you to, to reach the next level and the next level. And it ended up being a thing that we went from talking about winning the Masters right back to what can we do today? And it was about actually what we started on for about three months was improving his putting. And we worked on his mindset around putting. Um, and, and the whole thing was that as he got incrementally better at putting, his entire game got better. So he then started to make more money and he started to become more successful. And that's how it has to be. It can't, if, you're all, if your goal, I, probably the best way to explain it actually is, um, if you're working with somebody with the hips, so you've got a three foot putt and you can't get it in the hole. And what happens in that is that people focus on the ball going in the hole. And they get to the point where they're almost afraid to take their hands away because they're, they're so focused on the ball going in the hole. And the ball not going in the hole is devastating to them. So what we have to do is reset their mind to go, okay, well, what you actually have control over is the ball leaving your putter face. It's the pace you hit it and the line you hit it. That's what you have control over. Everything after that, you're out in the middle of an open field. Anything can happen to the ball once it leaves your putter face. So you have no control over the ball going in the hole. But if you get the mechanics of distance and, 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 and pace correct, you will get them more often than not. So what we do is we take the pressure off the result by saying, here's what you're going to do to get yourself in the hole more often. And it's exactly what Dave Allred has done with the likes of Johnny Wilkinson, and, and uh, he works at Owen Farrell, and he works at Francesco Molinari. And Johnny Wilkinson's famous kicking stance and the hands and all of this stuff. Everything was about lining up, being, being comfortable that he was completely aimed correctly at the target. And then the only thought process he went through was getting a clean strike on the ball. That's the only thing he thought about. And it's like, is it possible if I strike this ball while it's going in the bar? It's not going to happen every single time, but more often than not, it will. And you know, he was a real case in point of it. More often than not, throughout his career, it went all. And obviously, when you come into a team and you're trying to assess the individuals and also the team, how how long? Let's say, and, and how do you do that? Do you do it by? I know you have the questionnaires, but do you do you sit and do you observe? Do you watch the games? How do you how do you do your video analysis? Um, well, what I'm trying to do, um, and it's 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 something that's very difficult, but I'm trying to find a way of of measuring the impact of mental skills in high performance arenas, um, and it's one of the reasons why the kind of whole area of sports psychology hasn't been as embraced in sports science as the likes of strength and conditioning and, and, and the like. Um, is because it's very hard to measure the impact of mental change. Um, and one of the challenges in science is that anecdotal evidence doesn't really stack up, even though I feel like from my own personal point of view, when you're dealing with individuals, that if individually guys are coming forward and saying, my game is completely different because I took on this mental skill that changed my approach to the game, or I took on a mental trigger that helped me calm myself during performance. That's every bit as effective uh, performance tool as being fitter, stronger. You know, all the information GPS gives you. So, video analysis gives you a little bit of an extra layer where you understand. It's something that uh, we try to do. I've done it in in a number of different uh, countries and different sports, where we will film an athlete, sometimes we'll mic them up and we'll get them to talk their way through their performance while they're doing it and then we'll sit down with them afterwards and get them to explain to us what, you know, what were you, when you said this, when you performed this particular skill, what were you thinking? What was motivating you? And what's really useful actually, I've started to really toy with, um, and actually I have, a, I have a cousin living in town here who's really into drones and I've, I've, I've asked him to come out and film some of the work I'm doing with, with Ashley and Akati with the soccer team. And it's really interesting to see from overhead when you're looking at shapes. And if you see a guy shooting out of a line and this is a def defensive shape, the drone gives you such a brilliant overview of the pitch. And it gives you the opportunity to sit down with guys and go, lads, you know, explain to me where that came from and why did you make that decision and what is it that you're going to do differently the next time you're faced with that particular scenario. And really what you're doing is you're just using whatever tools are available to help guys make decisions on the pitch, you know, learn from their mistakes and make the decisions on the pitch. And 
traditionally the way you learn from your mistakes was your manager calling you out and telling you, you know, calling you several colourful names and you walking away going to have the clue what he was talking about. So now we're trying to give them actual concrete information so that they can walk away, evaluate their own performance and then make their own decisions on how to be better. So you're basically handing ownership back to the players. And I think it's hugely important for coaches and, and an area that I have become increasingly involved in, and I'm actually organising a couple of events in Limerick over the coming uh, months, um, is around educating coaches on language and behaviour and impact of same, and understanding how your messaging has a huge significance to the performance of the players, and also including players in the decision making process which is something that coaches would be very wary of and would probably feel a little bit like, oh, Jason, we're, we're being way too lovey and we're wrapping them in cotton wool. And that's not really what I'm about. I'm about, if you give a player every single opportunity to be the best player he can be and then he fails to deliver, well, you've got a much clearer picture of whether he's coachable or not or whether he's ever going to deliver for you. And you make the, the, the decisions you have to make. And at the end of the day, sport is ruthless. So, you know, you, you cut guys or you pick guys based on what you think they can perform. So surely, if you're going to put all your faith in picking guys, the logical thing is to give them all the tools you can give them to help them be better. I suppose, tell us a little bit, you know, before we finish up about the, the type of articles that readers and viewers can expect to see over the next uh, few months. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's a few, few ideas I'm kicking around. The, the, the first one is going to be about Limerick, the Limerick hurling team and the challenges they face this year. Um, and I'm going to have a little kind of investigation of their behaviour and their body language and things like that during the league to kind of see if we can see indications of where they're going to go in the championship. Um, and also what they're doing so much better than everyone else at the moment. Um, I'll also, I'm also going to look at, we just spoke about Munster earlier, I'm going to have a look at that kind of area and see is it fair that a lot of people have been very critical of them since they lost the Saracens. Or is there you know, a financial hierarchy in Europe and Munster have just been desperately unlucky to come up against the might of Saracens and the might of Paris in the last couple of years in semi-finals away from home? Um, you know, and then I'm going to go on and start looking at the, the, the key aspects of performance mindset, looking at teams that really get it, um, talking a little bit about some of the athletes I've worked with, some of the things I've done in the past, and a little bit about understanding what, what is it we can learn from an Olympic champion that we can use in a recreational game for a kid developing their skills in the pitch out and we do it. And finally, I suppose some of those events, some of those talks, and how teams, if they are interested in, 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 uh, in your expertise, how can they get in touch? Um, well, I will share my contact details with you. I'm currently re revamping my uh, website, which was uh, very Canadian slanted, so I'm, 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 that hopefully will be up and running next week. Um, and uh, if, if I, I suppose the easiest way to get in touch with me is either get in touch with Sporting Limerick or get in touch with um, Ashley and Cotton, who are uh, a club that I've been really enjoying being involved with for the last few months. And we have a, a big weekend coming up with hopefully an FAI semi-final if the FAI get the stuff sorted out.